Um, uh, I'm going to share my screen. This topic of professionalism is really one about, in some ways, it's a topic that has to do with culture, and it's a little bit hard to define also. Um, and so I hope people will um, feel free to send questions on chat as I talk, and uh, someone will let me know if questions have been asked. Oh, and then if we, if you want to talk, you can share your, uh, you can uh, turn on your camera, and we'd be happy to answer questions. So um, let me just, I'll just start clicking ahead in the, in this, in the slide set. So I don't have any, um, I don't have any uh, disclosures. And my learning objectives by the end of this workshop would be uh, help you so that by the end of this, you'll be able to describe three methods for attending to individual professionalism lapses. Um, and that would include exploring, remediating, and gathering evidence. So that's one objective. The second objective is to integrate a systems level approach to professionalism. And the third is to identify ways to support a culture of professionalism. So I'm, I'm very interested in this topic also and how it applies to your culture and your local environment because everyone is every, you know, doctors, while we all have the same kinds of diagnoses and stuff, we, all, we actually, a lot of our practice, believe it or not, is, um, is influenced by our culture and our local set of what is considered normal for behavior. So this is the outline of the talk. I don't know if I will be able to adhere to the timing, but we will talk, we've already done the introductions portion. I will talk about professionalism, what it means, and some introductory concepts about it. Then we'll have a case discussion, I hope, of 10 minutes. And um, I think what I'm gonna ask is someone to help me, maybe they're all in English, but maybe someone could read them in Thai. I think someone's prepared uh, a Thai translation just so we don't we can speed things up because we don't have that much time. And then what I'd like to do is for our second case, we'll have breakout groups of four people per group and people can discuss the cases amongst themselves and actually write down some answers kind of like we would have with students. And we also do this with our faculty, by the way. Um, uh, we could do this, uh, so write down some of your answers to these questions about the cases and then uh, come back in the large group and report what was said in the breakout rooms. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about the what spurred this talk and the background for this talk and how it got developed at UCSF, okay? So first introductions, we've done that. Professionalism definition of concept. Okay, so I tried to look this up in the English dictionary um, and it says, what is professionalism? It says the conduct aims or qualities that characterize or mark a profession or professional person. That is very vague to me. It still doesn't help me understand what professionalism is. Um, it, another definition is a calling requiring, well, it says profession is a calling requiring specialized knowledge and long and intensive academic preparation. That also doesn't get at or conceptualize what do I mean by professionalism. I think what we think of professionalism is a kind of a behavior or set of behaviors that we would acknowledge as being the role model or the ideal for our um, for our profession. So if we think of doctors, there are certain um, uh, behaviors that we would say, okay, that's professional or even highly professional. And these are other behaviors that are not professional. So maybe like if you yell at your colleagues, that's considered not professional, right? That's, uh, that's considered as something not professional. But there are other, now yelling at your colleagues may, it depends on the situation, whether that's really unprofessional or just only mildly unprofessional. And basically it's really, I mean, it'd be hard to understand if the person didn't yell, that could be a possibility too. So the, the question I have here is, how do we know when someone is behaving unprofessionally? The best way to know that actually is when you're the person, like that person, and you can understand the situation from their point of view. So in a certain sense, like the motivation behind why someone does something is very important when we think about professionalism. So it's not something you can just say yes or no, it's right or wrong a lot of times. You have to kind of, you know, as a psychiatrist, we think of it as you have to have empathy and be in the other person's shoes. And then you can say, okay, no, that was still really wrong. Or you can say, okay, that I can kind of understand as being something that may be not so great, okay? So uh, we all have issues with professionalism, I would say. Um, now, examples of unprofessionalism is, uh, and, and we'll go back to this, mischaracterizing a routine test as urgent in order to get it done faster. You know, 
uh, making fun of other doctors. That's considered kind of unprofessional. Uh, attending a dinner or social event sponsored by a drug or a medical device manufacturer or other business. This one, 29% uh, of people said that they did. This is a survey of doctors. And then transfer to patients so they could have taken care of it, so that they could have taken care of, so a patient that you could have taken care of, but then you said that to someone else because you were too busy. Like, and not because you couldn't take care of the person, but simply because you were overwhelmed or too loaded, too, too heavily, you just transferred this person to someone else. Um, that might be considered unprofessional. Like if you were another doctor, you wouldn't appreciate that behavior. On the other hand, if you're another doctor and, you can, and you're in that situation, you might see that you might do that. And it might kind of be better for the patient because you're overloaded already. And it might've been better to give them to another doctor who wasn't so busy, right? So again, it matters like how you think about it. It's not so cut and dried sometimes. Now in the past, at least in the United States, if you get brought up for a problem with your professionalism, that's kind of a big deal. So that, what that means is we think of it either, either this person is, a profession, it has, is professional, or if we don't hear about it, we just assume that they're professional, right? If they, they're either unprofessional or they're professional. There's either black or white, yes or no. There's no in between we think of, okay? And in general, in our, um, uh, in our system, responsibility for managing the problem, making sure doctors are not professional, tends to lie with the doctors. Right, as a doctor, you should uh, lies with um, the teachers. The teachers should be teaching the students how to be professional or not professional. I would argue that in general, it's probably um, not that hard to decide whether someone is professional or unprofessional. It, but it is, it is well. It, I shouldn't say it's that easy either. But um, uh, it, it probably is everyone's responsibility. Would be my argument that we all behave professionally. Now, this is uh, a way of thinking about attending to a range of professionalism lapses for medical students. And so if you think about professionalism as a range of things, you then have to think about um, a range of interventions. So like in the past, if you think of either the person just in, uh, is, is professional or not professional, they're either a doctor or they're not a doctor, we fire them, we get rid of them. Those are the two options. But trying to get in between and try to foster us to be as professional as possible is a much trickier and more nuanced and very important issue. So if you, if you meet with a student and they, if you find a student has had a professionalism lapse, depending on the situation, you may either explore and try to understand what happened. Sometimes the students don't even know, like this is what doctors are supposed to do. They're just, they just don't know. They're too young. We haven't, they haven't had time to be inculcated with our you know, beliefs and our values. So in that situation, you just want to explore and understand what's going on with the student, right? Uh, sometimes a student may have uh, re recurrent problems, and in that situation, you want to remediate. You have to help them fix this kind of situation and make sure it doesn't happen again. So in this situation, you might give feedback to the student. You might help them reflect. You might coach for change. And this is thinking about, you know, you, you can also apply the same things to faculty as well, okay? And then finally, if it's a clear, clearly an underprofessional thing, uh, the pay, uh, the student was you know didn't show up and you know by because of his or her behaviors the patient died or suffered from some significant event then we actually as gatekeepers for our profession we have to uh, we're basically in the role of trying to gather evidence so that we can dismiss the the, the the student okay and as I'm talking about this it makes me think of we have a professionalism as doctors but we also have professional issue as teachers. Now in the United States, there are two sets of, of actually values, profession, there are two professions, teachers and doctors, and those two professions have their own sets of um, uh, professionalism guidelines or values. Now we are in the situation, you're in the situation where we have to do both at the same time. So that actually is a little bit of a unique situation, right? So we have both, we have the ethical and professional obligation of being teachers, but also professional and ethical obligations to be doctors, right? Okay, so uh, please feel free to shoot any questions if you have. So how to attend to a range of professionals and lapses. Um, now, uh, there have been some studies looking at professionalism lapses, and oftentimes it's because of competing demands uh, on, the, on the person at stake. So I'll give an example. Uh, I'll, I'll confess to a professionalism lapse that I have as a teacher. Sometimes I get a bunch of requests to do feedbacks on the students. So I may get 10 forms I need to fill out for the students and I get them all at once and they're due in a week. 
And guess what? I don't spend as much time as I probably should on each one. You know, I should spend more time on each one and think about it and write some good comments for each student and give each student good feedback. But since I got 10 all at once and they're due soon, I don't, I don't, I, I, I have to rush it and don't, don't do as good a job. That actually is kind of an unprofessional act on my part. But you can see how that's part of a systems issue. I got all 10 of these things. I still have a busy schedule. I still have to work and eat and sleep and stuff. And um, um, I, I have to, they're due soon. So I'm in this conflictual situation where the, it can, it's easy for it to occur. And a lot of times in these studies, looking at professionalism lapses, they typically occur when there are conflicts and competing demands on the uh, teacher or the doctor. So for example, another one would be, sometimes you need to go home and go to sleep because you're post-call, you're so exhausted, you, you're probably a danger to your patients. Or on the other hand, maybe it might be better if you stayed because you know the patient better than anyone else. Right, so that's a conflict that you're in a conflict there. Should I go home and collapse and go to sleep or should I stay at work and maybe collapse or make a big mistake while I'm working? That, that's, a, that's a conflict um, and that's a, that's a ripe situation for professionalism lapses, um, as a, just as, a, as one example. And so in these studies, they showed that many professionalism lapses occur when there are these competing demands on the individual, okay? And so, this brings me to the second part of professionalism is it doesn't reside necessarily in the individual person. Professionalism can be fostered, either promoted or worsened by the system that you work in. So if you're in a system that constantly, you know, you're working all the time, you're really harassed, you don't get paid enough and stuff like that, you're more likely to have professionalism lapses. If you don't get paid enough, then you've got to go to drug companies and get money from them and you might do unethical things with the money and stuff like that. So, uh, to think about it that way. Okay, so not only is it the professionalism is, we, t we used to think of it as a trait in the doctor personally, but we wanna think about it maybe as a system where people can therefore begin to broaden how we deal with these problems. Now, I wanna mention the hidden curriculum. And I think we were talking a little bit earlier uh, before this thing started that, um, what is the hidden curriculum? Here is the unwritten, unofficial and often unintended lessons, values, and perspectives that students learn in school. And this contracts with the formal curriculum. So what happens at UCSF is we have this curriculum on professionalism and how to behave properly. And we say, you know, whatever you do, you should be really respectful of patients and then, you know, things like that. And then they go on the wards and then they're working with the resident or the faculty member and the faculty member says something very negative about the patient. Like that person is really lazy. So they deserve to have high blood pressure and be fat and obese and have diabetes. That, they're learning two different lessons. The lesson they learn from us is the formal curriculum. The lesson they learn from the doctor in the wars is the hidden curriculum. And they often can be at odds. So that's just a concept I wanna bring up with you that we have to pay special attention to the hidden curriculum. And we talked about how the fact is our students will be learning or your students will be learning about professionalism in this formal curriculum. Your job is the hidden curriculum. And the other issue is that we all learn professionalism, or I don't know about you, but I learned professionalism largely from the hidden curriculum. Fortunately, as doctors, we have a pretty high level of integrity and we have peers to help us think about these things. But still, I did not always have the best role models for um, uh, professionalism. So uh, the hidden curriculum is something we should really think strongly about. And the hidden curriculum often is generated from the system, right? That's the culture of our being a doctor or, or, or professors in a university, that's the hidden curriculum. Um, I want to, uh, yet another concept is professionalism is a, is a competency, a multi-dimensional uh, multi competency. So people have to be morally ready to be professional. They also still need judgment and skills. It actually turns out that like, as you get more experienced and are more expert as a clinician, doctor, physician, and teacher, you are probably more professional as you've gotten more experience. Hopefully you have, um, or you've seen situations where you may not be as professional and you work hard to try to avoid them, right? So I've tried to advocate for, you know, let's try to spread out the feedback a little bit so I don't get all 10 all at once and they're due the next day or two days from now or something like that. Because I, I need time to, to work on those things. Um, the other thing as teacher, our, so the 
part of the professionalism aspect of being a teacher is we are supposed to not only be good teachers ourselves, but we have to try to think about our system. And part of being a professional teacher is making sure your classroom is safe, your classroom is quiet, your classroom is a good place for people to learn. That's to give out as like a classic teacher. But we as teachers in the clinical setting have to also think about, is this environment a good place for our students to learn? And part of being a good teacher now and part of being a professional teacher means for, that you can't just be satisfied with what the situation hands you. Part of our job is to try to advocate, complain to the chairperson or whoever it is that this is not a good learning environment for the students. They're getting a bad education because of all these things happening. So I understand that you know even at UCSF we have the same issue. We can't change everything all at once. Changing the hospital is really hard to do. They're not designed for the students to learn. They're designed to teach patients, to treat patients. But we still got to think. We it's still incumbent on us. It's still our responsibility to think about how to make it as best as possible. So we also know that clinically or typically there are certain situations that are going to cause people to be less professional. So if the person is overloaded with work or doesn't get paid enough, if we have inconsistent or ambiguous expectations, there are institutional policy decisions that can impact us that make it harder for us to, for example, tell the truth all the time that we'll see later. Um, there are legal policies and there are physician reimbursement strategies that can make it harder for us to be more professional. So for example, if you pay a lot of money for one thing to be done and don't pay anything for another thing to be done, guess what? Doctors will start to do things that pay a lot of money. That shouldn't happen if we're being completely professional because it shouldn't be dependent on how much we get paid, whether we do this procedure or not. But you know, it does turn out that that's the way it, it can work out. So we have to be very careful about that. Um, this is just another way of considering uh, professionalism. I won't get into it, but these are ways of dealing with another way of dealing with professionalism over time. So there's a lot of literature or studies, papers written about this topic. Um, I have this slide because it, I think of professionalism as being in some ways kind of similar to um, substance abuse problems. But if you think about substance abuse problems, when we think about professionalism, we want to try to address immediate problems in the individual, we want to try to strengthen their commitment to change if the person has been having unprofessional behavior. There may probably isn't pharmacological treatment for unprofessional behavior, uh, but we want to then have an ongoing monitoring system for the person who hasn't been professional. We want to organize a system so that they're reinforced for being professional. A lot of times uh, doctors and teachers get reinforced by, to be unprofessional. And when I say reinforced, that means rewarded. Um, and in the end, we kind of have to sometimes restructure life patterns or restructure the whole healthcare system so that we can behave more um, professionally. That's a very ambitious last one, but that's, this is how we do it for people who have trouble with drinking too much. Same thing for us in being behaving, behave, uh, behaving professionally. Okay, these are just some examples of how do, how do we shape culture? Um, and there can be many others uh, but you can champion positive examples of professionalism. We probably don't do that enough. We can recognize high situation, high risk situations. We can teach, we're doing it now. We're teaching peers and leaders to address professionalism issues consistently and effectively. We try to uh, uh, deal with the pain points and remove unnecessary stressors by ensuring policies and procedures that reinforce desirable behavior. And we have to support reflection and renewal in the environment. I just want to emphasize that systems and culture can degrade over time. They need constant monitoring. Um, yeah. Political systems, I'm very aware of this in United, as examples in the United States, political systems can degrade over time. So we need to have constant monitoring. So I've talked enough here. Let me take uh, any questions or chat comments that I should be aware of. No? No, no, no question um, in the chat box. But okay. um, please feel free to to raise your hand or or to speak up if, yeah. if you have any question. This is all old old hat for you guys, I assume now, right? Or is it new? Uh, so just think about: is this new stuff that is, and if it's that stuff you don't understand, please feel free to comment and just. I, I think it'd be even helpful for me and for the moderators to say, is this new information for you or is this stuff that you've learned before and we should skip over it a little faster? 
Uh, Dr. Lee, I have a question. I yeah. uh, thank you for the talk, the, uh, for the first part of the talk. Uh, when students, I mean, when students uh, work in the wards and they see unprofessional behaviors, which is contrast to what they have been taught in class, do you, um, in in your school, do you have any um, uh, policies or any actions regarding to the, the difference they learn between? Uh, if, during their professional, uh, during their clinical year, and during the class, we we send them. Uh, you know, I don't know how often they read the emails, but we do send them emails, and uh, um, you know that's another topic: whether reading your emails is or not reading your emails is considered unprofessional behavior. And we actually try to teach them that not keeping up with this is considered unprofessional. And we also have a link in one of, in these emails that we send out that say, hey, if you observe any unprofessional behaviors, you should report that. That is, it's your professional obligation to report unprofessional behavior. Because as a profession, we have to kind of police ourselves. Um, and so we tell the students that we want you to tell us, and it's a link that they report not to me, but they report to my, the bosses uh, of the school. So that helps everyone to think about um, uh, communication in a way that we're teaching them this stuff and when they we want to then address the hidden curriculum as it were so um, and you know students still probably underreport these things by far we, we we're pretty sure that they underreport professionalism lapses by far probably they only report them and even then they don't report that much but if it happens to them directly but even then they may not report it. So if the, if the attending physician asks the, if the student, asks the students, for example, to bring in coffee and donuts or whatever you guys eat in Thailand, bring in the breakfast for, for rounds, the student may not complain about that. They probably almost definitely won't complain if they see the attending tell someone else to do that. But if they, if they themselves are asked, they might complain. But we're trying to teach them that they should complain, that that's not appropriate behavior. So I'm, I'm just giving you examples there. Okay. Uh, and you okay. can imagine there are stronger, worse examples. So, Thank so I you. think what I'd like, <laughs> I'd like to go into the case now. And I think well, it's in English, but I've invited someone to, to read it in Thai for us. And then we can have a little discussion. So uh, is someone ready to do that? Um, uh, uh, okay. <laughs> so... You want to read in English everybody, first? Everybody uh, understands English quite well in this. You think I should just read it in English? Is that good enough? That would be fine, yeah. If anyone wants us to read it in Thai, I think we should. It's good practice, but uh, okay. It's 2 a.m. A PGY2, also known as a second year resident, is on overnight call. They're in the ICU and the ICU is full and she is admitting a seriously ill septic patient in severe pain from metastatic cancer to the floor. So they're taking, the ICU is full, so they, she, she's been told, and it's really clear that we gotta get this one patient um, from the ICU into the hospital, regular hospital floor. On the other hand, she's called by a nurse from another floor about a patient uh, who that she's supposed to cover for. The patient was signed out with explicit instructions not to increase pain meds for his chronic pain. And the patient is demanding to be seen and the nurse is insisting that she come to go see this patient who's been complaining about this pain. And after the fourth call, the resident screams at the nurse, uses disrespectful language referring to the patient, slams down the phone, and all in the earshot of a busy nursing unit. And everyone hears like what the resident has said to the other nurse. Um, so uh, now, oh, do we have options for a poll here? Yes, or just a ch in yes, chat? I will. So do we yes, want to do I, the chat? People have to vote now what they would want to do. Okay, so let me launch the polling. <laughs> so everyone, has everyone see the poll? Do, do you see the poll? Yes, I do, yeah. Okay, yes, so, yes. so please vote at the option. And as a reminder, if you vote other, you have to say what you would propose. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so I'll give you oh, one minute to vote. Then. No, no what, the way we do it in, in, in oh. here at UCSF is we wait until everyone has voted. Okay, okay, so that sure. Way yeah. they, <laughs> they okay. Vote. <laughs> okay, okay, sure. We got 72%.
votes it right now. Okay. Okay. We don't have to have a hundred percent, I suppose, but we'd like to get above seventy. At night. Okay. Or at least above eighty or ninety. Okay. <laughs> With the message. Okay, just a few more. Okay, I think this might be good enough, Dr. Nassimon. Okay, okay, so I'll end the poll right now and okay. see the results. Okay. Everyone can see the results, what they said. Okay. So it's good. Okay. So most people vote uh, for option D. Yeah. I, okay. Okay, and this is no, there's no, um, uh, you could actually answer more than one of these would be realistic, I suppose. But let me hear what people uh, comments about why they voted what they did and people who said other what they would do. Um, so I vote for other. And what I would do, I would probably go talk with the people involved, include mm -hmm. to did that at least to show that I want to hear them out, want to know what what exactly happened in their own words before I do anything further. Yeah, so so that's that's like I was expecting if it's the first time this sort of thing happened, I should give some sort of um, corporately a feedback or s sort of instruction about the situation. That's my idea. Excellent. Well, uh, any other comments? Let me let me take some. Uh, let me go to the next slide. Thank you. That was an excellent comment. So, and that gets into the next slide. So, what other what actions would you take? What would you say to the learner or other trainees or to your colleagues about the situation? And what are some systems level interventions you might initiate to prevent similar events? So let's think about this as a systems problem as well as an individual resident issue. Anyone have any ideas? Uh, Let me ask you this. Is this a realistic scenario in your hospital? Can you give me a thumbs up or, or no answer? If anyone thinks that this might happen at your hospital with either a resident or a faculty member? Yes, it happens. No it happens. It happens, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I would ask uh, the, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah. Okay. Um, if I be a teacher, I, I would ask the trainee why why they do like this, like not no blame culture, no judge, just talk, less sitting and uh, talk with uh, the scenario, what happened, discuss with the fact and probe, probing what happened in her mind, like what the reason, the exactly reason why she act like that. It's many reason behind, uh, po possibly. So if we know what in her mind, we can change her behavior by change her attitude. She might not understand about patient safety, like um, pain is the fifth vital sign that she have to control. And, mm -hmm. and this is about patient safety. And she might not, um, she might good on communication skill and she can show empathy, but she, th she, she might think this is not a big deal. Something like that, or maybe uh, not a good communication, not, not quite good communication from nurse to her via phone. Some, something might, might be happen, many, many possibly, but we have to probe what happened, then we can, we can fix and help her. And this is only one, time problem for unprofessionalism i think it should be many time and many uh, perspective from 360 degree perception maybe we need more information to judge her or or probation of punishment this is my thought <clears throat> any other thoughts i've talked a lot so i, I don't want to 
I, this is one of those things where the more you think about it, the more you engage with it, probably the better. Um, I think it depends on um, the point of view of not only the res, uh, the resident, but I think another action is that you have to look at it from the point of view of the nurse and why they um, report it. I think, I, I mean, this is more of a clear um, example of perhaps um, the, the resident being more unprofessional, but there are cases where I think the residents are, or the fellows are professional, um, but then the communication might not be there. Or um, in the case, it didn't, didn't say the PGY2 was um, a foreigner or not. Sometimes foreign medical grads um, are not able to communicate as well. Nurses might not um, understand the urgency, why, um, and I, I'm not referring back to this case, but you know, they might understand the urgency of certain things that fellows might decide to do. So I think looking at it from the, both perspectives and um, also knowing that uh, why I, I answered the, because in a way, this is a common problem. It's not a once off, but it can happen to other trainees. It can happen to your colleagues. So at a systems level, I think it's important that we address it. And, and that's why I chose B because um, at the end, I think both um, from the nurse's side and from the resident or the doctor's side, there needs to be a better communication system. There may need to be, um, uh, uh, you know, this may be becoming more of a cultural thing in the sense that other trainees or other faculty members are doing this. And so uh, it has to be tackled, not just in this one person. Sorry, but you made a very good comment, so I got other comments or I'm thinking, yeah, anyone else? Uh, yeah, so um 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 sorry. Uh I think uh I, I would look at uh, the working system as well. This uh is there any uh I mean helper uh in, in case of the uh the the ward is very very busy so um yeah. because uh if you like deal with uh, very very severe patients like a lot and yeah. uh how how yeah so uh, i i i gonna look at that that working system uh to to assist uh, in case of uh, the the situation like this happen as well Um, I think I, these are all really good comments, and I, I just, in the interest of time, is maybe we should move along a little bit. But I, I wanted to highlight a couple of things. One thing that I would mention that just, and maybe this is too very obvious, but that, you know, what this when you go to speak to the learner, their reaction is kind of important to me at least. I think it's like so if they think, well, it's not that a big a deal. We can, it's okay to yell at people. So, that's different than the person who's very embarrassed and so I really wish I hadn't done that. To me, that makes a difference in the, right? Because in, in, the, in the case where the person doesn't think it's a big deal, that means it's kind of a big deal. In the other case where the person's really embarrassed and you know, wishes that hadn't happened and feels very uh, shameful, then that actually is good. I feel good about that in the sense of I'm not as worried about that person because they're less likely to do it in the future. Um, the one other systems thing that was mentioned when I was doing this uh, workshop at UCSF faculty is sometimes the sign out is, is a systems issue too. So if you have a patient who you think might want to have more pain meds and then you say, whatever you do, don't give them more pain meds. You must think that the situation may come up then that the patient will ask for more pain medications. You have to give some plan to the sign to the person who's getting that information of what to do because otherwise they were stuck like this resident too. So there wasn't a good sign out for this patient about what to do because the only instruction was to tell them don't give pain meds and then so then you're stuck, you know. Okay. Oops. Okay, so let's try try this as an experiment a little bit. So this is the breakout groups. Um, and so what I'd like to have happen here is we'll have a, a case discussion. Uh, so there'll be breakout rooms that will get put into. There'll be groups of three or four. Each uh, group we will ask to as assign a scribe who can type into the Google document um, that the link has been provided. So maybe we should provide it again just so they have. So you'll be randomly put into groups of four. So what you probably need to do is introduce yourselves quickly, assign a person who's gonna be the typer the typist into the Google document. You will then read the case summary and then you'll answer the, the you'll re discuss the questions and then the scribe will record your responses on the Google document. Hopefully that'll be clear once that happens. 
Uh, and if you need help, there's a little box on the, when you're in the breakout group, you can ask for help and then we will, someone can come into your breakout room to give you assistance with what to do. And so with that, we're very happy to do that. So are we, are we, is that? Okay, so. Are with that? Yes, it's very clear. So Dr. Lee, could you please read the cases before we break, uh, before the breakout groups yes, so that we are sure we understand? Yes, I will read the case, but then when you're in your breakout rooms, it's totally fine to clarify the issues in the case too, to discuss amongst yourselves. That's the whole point of this. So Sam is a final year medical student. Her senior resident is post-call and has to sign out and go home. The resident realized that she forgot to order a repeat chest x-ray on a patient who is being discharged today. Routine x-rays can take up to four hours to be done. So the resident tells Sam to order it stat so it gets done right away. So it gets done within an hour. Now from a prior lecture, Sam knows that having a patient occupy an acute care bed for an extra half day in the hospital is a problem. So uh, um, the attending over here is Sam tell radiology that the x-ray needs to be done right away because they want to discharge the patient. The radiology says they won't do it without a clinical indication to do its stat. So Sam, the student hesitates and tells them, tells radiology that the patient has coughed up blood so that the x-ray gets done stat. And, and by the way, this patient has not coughed up blood. So the student has made this up as lying to radiology so that the x-ray can get done right away so that the patient can get discharged. So let's do the breakout groups, I think. Okay. And the discussion, okay. these are the, these are the, so the, the discussion prompts are, you could talk about whatever you want though, and you may not have time because we only have 10 minutes, but what actions okay. would you take what would you say to this learner? What systems interventions would you take? And what would you, what would you do if it was a male or female patient, for example? Does that make a difference? Okay, so go ahead and click join and we will have a nice discussion. Give us 10 minutes. I, I don't know if you uh, got this, I, I, if you understand this, but actually we're doing a lot of things today. And so I really wanna thank my co-hosts Ms. Simone and Chinita, because not only are we actually talking about the topic of professionalism, but we're actually introducing how do you different ways of how to use Zoom in the in, in teaching. So a uh, big, uh, lot, very kind of ambitious agenda today. So just uh, briefly, we don't have that much time, but anyone, you know, if I had more time, I'd go through each group and make you each each group should say what they what the discussion was about. But today we don't have uh, that much time. Does anyone want to give a comment about what their group talked about and what? surprised them or was interesting to them? Um, we talked about something that, um, that uh, the institution should um, instigate a, um, uh, what do you call it, priority to discharge as an, uh, maybe an indication of a semi stat x-ray uh, in this case, the, the medical students perhaps doesn't have to lie um, and at, <laughs> at the same time um, so that um, you know, like we can facilitate. But, but at the same time, so I think we, we did mention that we need to talk to the student. I think it's a good opportunity to talk to the medical student before they become a doctor early yeah. on. That, um, lying is not okay. Um, but at the yeah. same time, we understand you know, the urgency and, and why they need it and, and then uh, we also wanted to, we thought about the sign out process that perhaps um, the resident who is in charge of the case should be the person um, ordering a chest x-ray instead and don't leave it on um, for this um, on-call residents and the medical students. Um, perhaps that system can, can, can also be helpful. But I think talking to the students is, is important and taking them aside and not, you know, um, exposing them to like other medical students yeah. <laughs> and why do you lie, you know. Um, but but um, from that sense, it's important. I think we didn't reach the point where the, the third question is very interesting. Um, our group didn't reach the point to discuss that. Um, but I think it's an interesting thing because I think uh, culture um, also like the seniority and the culture uh, matters a lot in that in this case because you know the residents is, is above you and if the senior resident says, you know, do, do it. Um, I think as a foreigner, and if you're, um, you know, going to the States and you're a foreigner, I think, you know, you, you try your best to do whatever the senior residents say. So I think it also um, probably would work the same, you know, in the States if 
even if you're a um, um, uh, local medical student, but the senior resident has to um, uh, give feedback and score you on how you work. So I think in this case, I think there needs to be perhaps like a, a route for them to report. You know, I mean, this is a case where the medical student chose to lie else, but at the same time, it's, um, you know, we understand, I think there's a, re a clear good reason, like the medical students understand the safety of the patient. That, that's the point that I want to praise the medical student. They understand that there's x-ray before um, the patient discharge and, you know, they don't put it under the carpet and say, oh, uh, I might as well discharge without the chest x-ray. So I yeah. think that part, um, we commend them, but then at the same time, you know, um, it's a struggle, so. That sounds like a really great discussion. So from the teacher's point of view, that's exactly the kind of discussion we hope that each of the groups will have. And that when you have a discussion, you're in a small group like that, these lessons are learned much more strongly. And so what you just said was, I don't, I can't say it any better, like all the topics you mentioned were really perfect and right on. And, and normally you might have more time. We're just, I'm just trying to do too much today, I think. But just to give you a flavor of how these things might work. Um, you know, one of the, I, I, the reason why I added the last question is because, you know, in the United States, at least, we worry a lot, and you might have heard a lot about uh, racism. And so if we have a black student versus a white student versus a Chinese Asian student, you know, do we treat them differently? Um, uh, male versus female students, you know, so we want to try to think about these things, help the faculty think about these things in advance so they don't have a bias, right? Because when you get in these situations. Um, in this particular situation, I'm just going to make a few comments. In this particular situation, the student actually, we can understand them better, right? Because it wasn't like they were trying to get a better grade or, or look good or something like that. They were, they did lie, but they were lying so that they could, what they thought do the best thing for the patient or for the system, the hospital, to do what they thought. So they were caught in this competing values kind of situation. Um, I, I gave this talk, uh, I gave this workshop and there was a pharmacist in the audience, you know, in our school of pharmacy is also part of our, our university. And he said, you know, all day long, I basically go from morning till night and doctors are just lying to me about why they need different medications, right? So we all lie. I mean, that's just, we have to like face it. I mean, have you, I, 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 maybe you don't in Thailand, but here in the United States to get what we want, we sometimes have to, if not lie, say things that are not actually true, which is lying, I guess, but I'm trying to say it in a nice way. Um, and uh, we do it all the time. And so we want to try to set up the system so that we don't have to do that. Obviously, that's, that's not so good. Um, and so um, thinking about this from, you know, I, everything you said was exactly right. I don't want to repeat it all, but all the things about the system and so forth was really important. The other thing we want to think about is the hidden curriculum may be, you know, the student from our point of view was lying, but from the resident's point of view, they may say this student was the best student. They know how to get things done. They know how to work a hospital system and really make things happen. You know, I, I don't know if you realize that, but the students may be under different kinds of pressures and they may be think, taught differently than what we are teaching them. That's just the hidden curriculum. So I just I uh, wanted to bring that because I, those two other items came up in our discussion um, at UCSF with this, this case. So I just want to set up like how did we discuss professionalism at UCSF. Actually, we did this, I did a version of this workshop six different times. Uh, at, at, we have six different physical plate locations of our hospital. We have a VA hospital. So I actually went around with some help from my colleagues, very important. Uh, we, we went to these different places and we did this workshop with uh, various groups. We actually had a draft of the guidelines, which I can send to you, like that's, you know, kind of academic, just a one page thing that says, as a doctor, you should do this and that. Um, you should be professional and so forth. But we, we, we had this document that everyone read and thought about in, and also worked on these cases at the same time. So it really brought the, the guidelines to life, which sometimes can be like, you know, a, a kind of academic, kind of dry, a dry kind of thing where you just talk about what doctors should do in the abstract. So bring, having the cases really helped. So I just want to mention that that was the process. So um, I think we have to end here. Thank you so much for attending this. I, right in the beginning of your day, I know you're all very busy. Uh, just to summarize, we talked about professionalism as uh, not just yes or no, but a whole range of behaviors and also professionalism that can be fostered by the system and as a culture. So I really want to emphasize it's not just the individual person, but the culture. Uh, we talked about a couple of cases, which I think 
uh, were meant to uh, help facilitate the discussion. I thought we had a really rich discussion about it. And in the process of doing all this discussion about professionalism, we're all on the range of professionalism. Sometimes we lie to get the pill to help our patients. Sometimes we don't fill out our feedback forms as well as we should. So we all are on this range of professionalism. We try to be as good as possible. You never get to be a perfect doctor. It's actually not possible, but we try to strive to be as good as we can be. And so uh, we did a lot of things today and, in, in, and during this time in the process, tried to show some clear ways of doing virtual teaching using Zoom. And I really wanna thank my colleagues for doing the polling, the breakout rooms, getting this all set up, uh, monitoring the chat. And so thank you all very much and we gotta stop. <laughs>